Amen. Let me just also say a word about uh, Francois coming and his wife Lydia will be with us Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. You don't want to miss this, seriously. I'm, I'm serious. You don't want to miss this. They were with us last year and they did it. I just fell in love with them and Andre Robb was with them. And, and hopefully he'll be here maybe sometime in the summer or toward the fall. But this will be well worth your time. Now, when it comes Friday night, and I know you've been working, don't go home and say, oh, we're just tired, we'll just wait and go Saturday. Then Saturday comes, you say, we've been busy all day, we don't feel like going tonight, we'll go tomorrow morning. You're going to miss two-thirds of it if you do that. Just make a plan, and uh, just be here Friday night at 7, Saturday, just put it into your schedule. And let's, let's gather together and, and feast on the Word. The man has some amazing things to say, some amazing revelation. If you've read any of the Mirror Bible, you know, I, I love the Mirror Bible, but I love the notes that he puts in the Mirror Bible, probably as good or better than the Mirror Bible, because he has just some, some really awesome in, insights and some, and some really good things that he has to say. So he's coming from South Africa, uh, he's been in Louisiana, he'll be in Memphis, and he's flying into us from Memphis. So make your plans to be with us next Friday night at 7. And guys, let's gather in for the breakfast. I'll give you a chance to, to meet him personally. Also have some fellowship with one another. It's going to be a good time. Make sure you fill your little form out and hand it to one of the ushers uh, when you leave because I'm expecting we're going to have a pretty good uh, turnout of men for the breakfast. And any of you that are watching on the stream, come on down to Houston. We're having some beautiful weather right now. And uh, there's no place like Houston, I'll tell you. Some of you need to hear God and just move here. I'm, that's, that's just what the way it is. Amen? Amen? All right, let's take our Bible this morning. I want to talk to you about uh, how to make a spiritual transition this morning. How to make a spiritual transition. Uh, and I, want to, I want to pick on Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 to just get us thinking about the changes that we're making in our life and the changes that we're going to continue to make uh, over, over the next months and years of our life. I want to read five verses from Genesis chapter 12, talking about spiritual transitioning this morning. I don't know if, if you've been like me, but I feel like over the last few years, I have changed more in the last uh, four or five years than I did my whole previous life in the way that I see things, the way I read the Bible. Just, just, it's been, it's been a, an awesome trip for me. And I, I know that there are thousands of other people that are coming down the same road that are making the same transition. So I want to help you a little bit this morning with <clears throat> three questions, really, that I asked, have asked myself, continue to ask myself, as I make changes, as, as, I, as I progress in this walk and understand the message even better. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1 says this. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, now I want you to understand, this man is 75 years old. And he's not a man of God, so to speak. He's actually an idol worshiper that lives in Mesopotamia. And God just breaks in on this guy. And God begins to speak to him. And he says, Abraham, I want you to get out of your country and away from your family and from your father's house to a land that I'll show you. I would have stopped right there and said, look, why don't you tell me the land? And then I'll kind of make up my mind if I want to go, right? But he, he, can you begin to see the change that God brings to this 75-year-old man? Don't ever think you're too old to change. Don't ever think you're too old to change. Comes to this man, he's not even, you know, close to God, he's He's a man who really doesn't even know God very much. And God begins to direct him and bring change into his life. He says, I want you to get away from your father's house, out of, away from your family, away from your country, everything familiar. And he said, I will make you, verse 2, I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. I'll make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. That's good. Not only will I bless you, you'll be a blessing. That makes life good, doesn't it? I not only want to be blessed, I want to be a blessing. So he says, that's what I'll do for you. He said, I, in verse 3, he said, I will bless those that bless you. I'll curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Amen. Now Abraham's scratching his head because how are all the families of the earth going to be blessed in him when he has no children? He's moving away from everything that's familiar, all of his security, everything that he's, he's known to be familiar in 75 years of life. And he says, I want you just to pack it up and get out of Dodge, and I'm not even going to tell you where to go. 
Abraham says, where am I going? God says, I'll tell you when you get there. Tremendous change going on in this, in this guy's life. One of the common threads, and I, after, I, after I caught this with Abraham, I started going back through other, other people in the Bible, and it seems to be a common thread that runs through people from the Old Testament to the New Testament to uh, the reformers of the Protestant Reformation. Right down to today, there seems to be a common thread that those that God uh, kind of separates out, which is all of us, they undergo continual transition and changes in their life. God is not static. We don't serve a static God this morning. The Holy Spirit never stops moving. The Bible says that the kingdom of God is an ever-increasing kingdom, and of its increase, there will never be an end. So now I want you to visualize it. As the kingdom increases, as things progress in the kingdom, as things change, as things keep moving, the kingdom is going to then be inhabited by people that know how to change and flow and go with this kingdom that is always changing and always increasing. As the kingdom increases, as things change, as things move, as the kingdom moves forward, you're going to have to know how to change and transition with the kingdom or you're going to be left behind. If you don't know how to make a change, how to make a transition in life, all of the movers and the shakers in the kingdom of God have been changing so much that what you'll, you'll begin to feel like is that change is effortless. You're just in this constant state of change. Every man and woman of God went through major transitions in Scripture. Every person that's sitting here in the sanctuary, you go through transitions. Can I tell you, I'll just let you in on a secret. You're even changing this morning as you sat there. You're changing in ways you may not recognize this morning, but you're changing in ways even as you're sitting in the presence of God this morning, sitting in church. I mean, how many of us already, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of us already has the Holy Spirit done an upheaval and a major transition in just the way you see things, the, what you believe, the way you read your Bible, just things that are going on in life? You all of a sudden have been a transition. Now you're seeing God in a whole different light. You're not seeing Him as this distant, angry deity. You're now seeing Him as a father that has intimacy with you and has changed your whole perception on things. I mean, honestly... I didn't ask for any of this. I wasn't looking for it. It just started breaking forth. It was like a little drip at first. And then it seemed like, you know, the more you have a heart to change, two, two things are not, the more you have a heart to change and you spend time alone with the Father, the more revelation comes. And now it's like every time I just sit down and read the Bible or, or read a book or whatever, it's, it's, that little drip is like turned into this tidal wave that everywhere you look, you see things that you didn't see before or you have a reaffirmation of what he's already been showing you. And you go, man, what is, you know, what is all this going on? I believe with all my heart, and I, told, I think I said this on Easter morning, that God has prepared a thousand people that are going to connect to us at Grace Point as a first wave to carry this explosive, life-changing, evangelistic message of the finished work of the cross and this pure grace that God has given to us, carry it into this city and around the world. Just a thousand as a first wave. And some of you are, all of you that are sitting here this morning, you're part of that wave. I'm telling you this morning, as the Father through the Son and the Spirit begins to attach a thousand people to us, you're going to have to have a lot of love. I'll just prepare you. You're going to have to have a lot of grace. Everything that we're talking about has got to now be assimilated into your life so that when people come in in various stages of transitioning and change, you're going to be able to minister to them out of the depths of what you already have. Patience is going to be a big thing. You're going to need a lot of patience to deal with people because they're going to vacillate in and out. They're going to take a step forward, two steps back. For whatever reason, I, I don't know why, God's put his hand on you. And you're in for an incredible adventure. I'm going to tell you right now, you're in for an incredible adventure. If you thought following Jesus was boring, you just hang on over the next couple of years. You're in for an adventure like you've never experienced. God has pre been preparing you. God has been preparing this city. I didn't know when I moved here in 1980 
I didn't know anybody when I moved to Houston, Texas in 1980. Never been here, didn't know anybody. Just felt a draw to come to Houston. And I want to ask this morning, how many of you, I want you to stand up. If you were not born in Houston, Texas, you just came here. You were not born in Houston. Now just look. Just look. God got a hand on you in Ohio, Indiana, Pennsylvania, Florida, Georgia. You can be seated. Other countries. And brought us all together in Houston, Texas. Now, if I, were, if I were back where I was, was born and brought up, back in Battle Creek, Michigan, and I were to go to church and say, now look, I want all of you that were not born in Battle Creek to stand up, there would be a little smattering, just, you know, a little... Because everybody in Battle Creek is born in Battle Creek. You work at a cereal factory. You have a little five-acre farm with a couple horses and cows. You raise your family. You work 30 years at the cereal factory, you retire, you live out your years, you go to Florida, you get a place in Bradenton, <laughs> and then eventually you pass off the scene and your children are working in the cereal. Everybody stays there, right? And maybe where you're from is kind of the same way. That, that's not the way with us that are here this morning. We've come from all over the world. You know why God's brought us from all over the country, all over the world? Because he had a plan before the foundation of the world that at 1315 South Dairy Ashford, there would be a, a life-changing message that takes place. And he's prepared your heart for it. He's been preparing us for it. In fact, when I got out of school, when I graduated in 1969, I was offered a church in Houston, Texas, Church of the Nazarene. It was on Broadway. I had no clue. I, I said, no, I'm not, I didn't want to go to Houston. I stayed where, where I knew, I stayed in, you know, around the Midwest. But I thought, man, you know what? What if I would have come to Houston in 1969 instead of 1980? I would have had an 11-year jump. I didn't get it the first time. I got it the second time, and I came. You know, what do they say about, about Texas? There's two groups of us, those that were born here and those that got here as quick as they could. And most of us got here as quick as we could because we weren't born here, right? God was working something. God's doing something in our lives, and you need to recognize that. He's pulled us together. And as, as you learn more of him, as you spend time with him, his, as his nature fills you, his plan gets clear. It, it becomes more crystal. It, it just becomes really obvious. It comes in focus. It gets sharper. So on, a, on an everyday nuts and bolts basis, here's what I'm saying. I'm saying that you're going to be making a lot of choices over the next couple of years. Next couple of years, you're going to make a lot of decisions about not only about what you believe, what your theology, how it transitions, how it changes. I'm talking about choices about jobs, careers, ministries, businesses, locations, where to live. I think the most important decision you can make, and it's just me, I'm a pastor, so I understand that. Most important decision that you can ever make is where do you go to church? Most of us are not led by where we go to church, we're led by our jobs. When our job transfers us, we don't even question, we go. There are going to be lots of choices and decisions made over the next years. And the shepherd will lead you to make center of will choices if you know how to make a transition. Now the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, it talks about getting established in what God is doing. It says in 2 Peter 1, 12, For this reason, Peter said, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. What God is doing today is he is establishing you in the present truth. Present truth is what is being revealed now. Present revelation. The way we see it today. And I don't have, I, I, I'll just remind you again, there's an awesome move of God that is, that is beginning to work into the earth. And I understand more now than I ever did before what Jesus meant by leaven in a lump. It's leaven in a lump working right now. Matter of fact, Jesus said in John chapter 13, verse 20, 21, he said, the kingdom of God is like leaven in a lump that a woman put into a lump of, of dough that's going to make bread. And she just puts a little leaven in there, but the leaven works and it works and it works until the whole lump is leavened. 
Now, what God is doing right now, you're part of the leaven. God is taking you, and he's putting you into the lump of Houston, Texas. And this, this little leaven over here at 1315 South Derry Ashford is going to continue to leaven until more gather, more gather, more gather, more gather. I'm telling you, until the whole lump of Houston is leavened. This thing has become not just a little interesting teaching or message. It's become a tidal wave of God's move, and I don't think anybody can stop it. Because it is leaven in a lump. If you're not sensitive, however, to the Spirit of God, what He's doing, you're not going to hear it, and you may miss the transition. God's going to keep working. God will keep moving, but he will, he will have to just kind of set you back until you get it. Like the children of Israel, they left Egypt in an entire generation. God was taking the children of Israel to the promised land. The difficulty was there was an entire generation of people that could not transition and they died in the wilderness. I don't want to die in the wilderness. I want to make the transition. God's going to, God's going to get his job done. God's going to get the work done. But he, it requires a people that have an ear and a heart for truth, that spend time with him so that he can begin to lay out how the transition needs to take place. And that's difficult for some of us because we've been hanging around church for a long, long time and the change is not easy. Jesus said, new wine breaks old bottles. The old bottles, the old wine stands, they don't change because as the wine expands and ferments, the old bottles, the old wineskins will break. And some even say the old wine is better than the new. Oh, I've heard that so many times the last three or four years. Well, I just, I like the, I like the way that it always was. I learned so much from this and I learned so much from that. Well, I say glory to God, praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, that you learned a lot from that. But if you think that's all there is to learn, you've missed it. So traditionally, what God has had to do, whenever there is a new, new wave, he has to raise up new people because the older people will not transition. The old refuse to transition. I mean, of all the groups in the earth that should have recognized Jesus, it should have been the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the word people of the day. Man, they knew it. They knew, look, no, look right here. They knew the word. You weren't going to confuse them with the word. They knew the word. And yet they're the one group that should have recognized Jesus. But you know what? They refused to make a transition. They refused to make a change. In, in John chapter 10, I want to I just read read to you how in the world these people that knew their Bible, if I can just use it in that context, they didn't really have a Bible, but knew the Scripture so well, how they could miss Jesus standing in front of them. And I'm wondering this morning, how can some of us miss what God is doing when He's standing right in front of us? Now here's what it says. Watch this in John chapter 10. Let me start with verse 19. John chapter 10, verse 19. Therefore, there was a division again among the Jews because of the sayings of Jesus. Verse 20. And many of them said, He has a demon. He's mad. Man, I've heard some. I've, it's like, this is like now. You come with what God is showing, revealing, and moving to now. People say, What's wrong with you, man? That's, that is totally. That is totally wrong. Why do you listen to him? Verse 21. Others said, uh, these are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? See, some get it. Some don't get it, some get it. How can some get it and some not get it when they're listening to the same man? Some people have a heart for truth. Some people don't have a heart for truth. Those that said he has a demon don't listen to him. We're stuck in the old. Those that heard what he had to say were willing to transition and move to where he was going. Can you see that? All right, verse 22. Now it was the feast of dedication in Jerusalem and it was winter, verse 23. And Jesus walked into the temple in Solomon's porch, verse 24. Then the Jews surrounded him and said to him, How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, plainly Tell us. They had the scriptures that plainly told them. How could they miss it? How could they move away from it? 
They had no heart for truth. They had no heart for transition. Listen, over the next few years, deeper truth, whether it's deeper truth, revelation, a sense of leading like Abraham had, a new job, a new business, a new career, a career change, yes or no? How do you know? How do you know? I want to give you three questions this morning to help you make a transition in life. I believe some of you are sitting here this morning. I know a lot of you are sitting here and you're looking at major, making some major changes. Either God is speaking some things to you or he's pulling you. Your, your heart is being drawn in a certain direction and you're wondering, is this God or is this not God? How do I, how do I make a determination? I want to give you three questions. These three questions, I'm going to tell you, they have, they've been very personal to me. I've asked myself these lots and lots and lots and lots of times over the last five, six years. All right, first question you want to ask yourself is this. When you feel like God is bringing you a revelation, a deeper truth, you know, leading you like you did Abraham, new job, business, start something, anytime you're making changes, first question you want to ask yourself, and this is so obvious you're going to snicker, but it's, it's, it leads it off, and these are going to go in order of priority. First thing you want to ask yourself is, is this the will of God? Is, what I, is, is this what God is saying? You've got to know you've heard from God. Is, is this what he is speaking to me? If lasting change is going to take place, then you must hear God speaking. Right? You've got to know that what you're going to do is the will of God. That is, that is the baseline determination you have to make. And I'll help you with that in just a minute. I want to show you Paul transitioning with just a few verses of Scripture. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Galatians chapter 1. I want to show you Paul transitioning. Galatians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses 11 down through 17. and just show you Paul. Galatians chapter 1, verse 17. All right, first question. Is this the will of God? Is this what God is saying to me? Might not be what God is saying to the person next to you. Is he saying this to me? In verse 11, Galatians chapter 1. Paul said, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. Now, man, if you're going to preach a gospel that is not according to man, you better make sure you're, you've heard God. <laughs> you're wide open to be shot down, I'll tell you right now. If nobody else is preaching what you're preaching or teaching, you are not, you're probably not going to get a lot of attaboys. And Paul, Paul's up front about it. He said, look here. He said, the gospel that I preached to you was not according to man, verse 12. He said, I didn't receive it from man, nor was I taught it. But it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So what Paul taught, he said, didn't come to me through somebody. I had to know that I know that I know that I know that God was saying this to me. All right? Verse 13. For you heard of my former conduct in Judaism. Now he's going to show us his transition. You heard of my former converse, conduct in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God beyond measure, tried to destroy it. He thought he was doing God's will. And I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of the fathers. Now here comes the transition. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, neither did I go to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Now let me point out real, real fast here in that 19th verse. He said, I didn't, I didn't go anyplace. I went into the desert. You know why he went into the desert? He had to make sure because of what he heard was so contrary, so different than what had ever been ministered before, he had to make sure that he was hearing God. He had to separate himself off. Now, what, whatever God is saying to you, it may require some extended time that you break off from other people or from other things, other activities. You, you might have to get alone to get it right. Let me encourage you to do that. I would just say also real fast, everything that you hear today, you don't have to go blab tomorrow. All right? Every good thing you hear today, it might be good. You don't have to blab it tomorrow. Mary pondered these things in her heart. 
Paul went into the desert in Arabia to get it nailed down, to get it, to get himself where he was positioned to know that he could speak with confidence. This was in fact what God wanted me to do. All right? The more, the more your communication lines are open, the more you can get off, the more your communication lines are open to the Holy Spirit, the more, the more all the barriers will go down. The more that you uh, uh, are unclouded, Maybe unburdened is a better word. The more that you're unburdened by circumstances, by, by people, or by money, the more clearly you'll hear. Okay? So you have to, you have to, so it takes time to get in a place where you're not burdened down by circumstances, people, or the pull of money. And the more unburdened you are with those things, the easier it is to make transitions. So the will of God, the move of God, you're perceiving a pending transition has got to be asked one question. Is this the will of God? Now, I want to help you know if something is the will of God. How do you know if something is the will of God? That, that, that is number one this morning. Is it the will of God? Now, let me give you an ABC under that that help you know if something is the will of God or not. Are you taking notes? All right. Is it the will of God? First thing that you'll, you'll discover if it's the will of God, there will be a witness of the Holy Spirit with your spirit. There will, there will be a, a, a confirming, a spirit-to-spirit -spirit agreement. I'm not talking about your head. Your head fights everything new. Your head doesn't like things new. Your head likes comfortable. Your head likes the old. Your head says the old wine is better. But there is something. Whenever I hear truth, there is something inside of me that goes... Yes. And my head says, no. Have you ever found that? When God begins to shake you out of your normal patterns, the first reaction is no, because it feels uncomfortable. I like my old pair of shoes. They're comfortable. I like my old recliner. I get a new recliner. I don't like the new recliner. I like the old one better. It's got all the little things where my backside go and it's just shaped right for me right it's come and we get comfortable spiritually too so that when God begins to break in our spirit says oh our spirit says if only it were true if only that were right and our heads go no 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 the old is better stick with what you know but when you move off with God, it, the, what, the more your spirit gets in control the longer it goes the more time the Holy Spirit has to settle you in and you begin to trust Him more. And you gain this quiet confidence because the Spirit continually feeds your spirit that truth. It just keeps feeding your spirit that truth. And pretty soon, your spirit reaches a tipping point to where you got it, and then your mind has to begin to listen to what the Spirit is saying. In, in Romans chapter 8, in in verse 14, and you've read these verses a lot, but let's look at them with some new eyes this morning. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 14, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. This is where, we, this is where we're to be led. As many as are led by the Spirit of God. It doesn't say as many as are led by the Bible, does it? I don't want to shake you up too bad this morning, so I won't say much on that. It doesn't say as many as are led by the Bible. As many as are led by the Spirit of God. The main place you are led is in your spirit, by the Spirit. Okay, the Spirit, when, you, when, when He begins to show you something new, it begins to resonate in your spirit. Verse 15 says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. If something is moving around on the inside of you and, you, and it makes you fearful, that, I'll tell you what, that's not the Spirit of God speaking to you. But you've received the spirit of adoption whereby you cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. The, Ho the Holy Spirit bears witness, capital S, with our spirit, small s, that we are the children of God. And if you're children, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Jesus. If indeed we suffer with him, then we'll also be glorified together. So that whole passage, 14, 15, and 16, is talking about the Holy Spirit working in your spirit. And there are a lot of times you're going to know, just wave at me if you know this is true. There are times that you know truth in your spirit, even though you can't put words to it yet. 
I've heard truth that is, I've known it was truth for two or three years. And I've tried to verbalize it to people. And when I verbalize it, the first argument they give me, I'm shot down because it's not really me yet. You know it in your spirit first. You, even though you can't put words to it, even though you don't understand it in your mind yet. Boy, when I heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit way back in the 70s, I knew in my spirit, man, this is, this is true. This is some dynamite here. But my head, my background fought the baptism of the Holy Spirit for a long time because it was, I thought it was wrong of the devil and only fanatical, crazy people did that kind of stuff. But my spirit knew it was good. And I liked hanging around those Pentecostals. I liked hanging around those charismatics. There was something about them. I enjoyed their company, but my head said, whoo, weird. <laughs> and some of you, I, you know, I got a couple interesting emails this week that had a little trouble with last Sunday morning because it didn't quite fit the paradigm of what we're used to, right? So the spirit, I got to keep going here. Second thing, under is it, is it the will of God? There's a witness of spirit with your spirit. Second of all, help you know it's the will of God. When you read and meditate the word, the word will confirm the witness of the spirit. When you read the scripture, the scripture will confirm the witness of the spirit. See, the Bible says that his word is a lamp unto your feet, it is a light unto your way. To know that you've heard from God is to see the confirming and see the confirming in the word and that's vital. Now let me just tell you one thing about this. Here's what I, I used to do years ago. If I felt like God was leading me in a particular area, I would get a concordance and try to find every verse that had to do with that area that I thought he was leading me to. Listen, God's not confined to that. You can read anywhere in the Bible and the Holy Spirit will quicken that word to you and minister to you about what the Spirit's been saying. All right, You don't have to try to help him out by limiting down to the subject that you think he's speaking about to try to see what the word says about that particular subject. His word is spirit and it's life. It can, it can break it down for you. You can wonder if you should be moving to Tampa, Florida, and you get every scripture on traveling and moving, whatever, and you can be reading over here something else totally entirely, and the Holy Spirit will just break in and show you something. Right? You, don't, you don't have to try to narrow the word down. The word, the word has, has an amazing effect to come along and help to confirm what the spirit is saying. But I don't move without the Spirit saying first. I really don't. I've, I've, I've kind of reversed order. I used to go to the Word first, and I listened to the Spirit first. And I let the Word kind of confirm what the Spirit is saying. I'm not as much a Word guy as I used to be. I'm learning to be led by the Spirit more and let the Word trail along and say, yes, this is what the Spirit is saying. Let, let, let me show you through the Word. All right. Third thing to help you know if it's God's Word is this. It, it helps to be... If, if it's confirmed by those that have been joined to you in the body, if you're feeling a particular thing, it's good to have a confirming by those that are joined to you in the body. And those that have been, I'm, I'm talking about, everybody needs one or two or three people that are absolutely rock solid that you have confidence in. That you can go to them and, and discuss and hash out and listen to the wisdom that they're telling you. Now I want to say one thing about that. That group of people is going to change over the years. I'm going to give you some real wisdom right here. Are you listening? The people that got you to where you are today are not necessarily the people that need to get you to where you need to go tomorrow. Some of the people that help get you to where you are today will have no understanding of where you're going tomorrow. There's an old saying that, that when the student is ready, the teacher appears. And I have found that when you're prepared spiritually, the right person, the right couple of people begin to form around you that understand where you need to go and can give you wisdom that the people that help get you, and God, God bless and thank God for the people that help get you where you are today, but they are not necessarily the people that will take you where you need to go. Sometimes you have to and I'll give you another point in a minute, but sometimes you have to grow with a little bit different group. But it's, I, think, I think having some wisdom from a multiple of counselors is really wise. In Acts chapter 13, the first three verses, Paul you know, was getting this whole thing settled down. He was ready to, to transition, ready to move out. 
And there's a, there's a great little revelation in chapter, Acts chapter 13, the first three verses. Let's read this. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Verse 2. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Verse 3. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. Now do you know what an encouragement that is when somebody comes to you and says, You know, I just feel like God's really... I love it when somebody comes to me that I don't go to, but they come to me and say, man, I just feel like God's really doing this in your life, and it's exactly what God is saying to me. That's what happened there. When they prayed and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate Barnabas and Saul for the work that I've called them to do. Now, Paul already knew that he had been separated for the work that he'd been called to do, but it's good when somebody comes and says, you know what, the Lord told me that it's, this is what you need to be doing. What a confirmation it is. I don't run around looking for a word. I don't ask somebody to give me a confirmation. But if the, if the Lord uh, moves on somebody's heart to say something to you about what you feel in your heart you need to do, then you know what? That's a great indication. Everybody needs a couple of people that are in that situation. They can lay hands on you, pray for you. And uh, Notice they sent them out. They didn't just go. We are big for just going. I think there's a big thing about being sent. I think it's good to be sent. Right? It's good to be sent. So is this the will of God? First question. And what helps us to know it's the will of God, there is a witnessing of the Spirit with your spirit. There's a confirming in the Word as you come through the Scripture. And those that God has put attached to you in the body of Christ oftentimes will give a confirming word or let you know that, yeah, I really hear that same thing too, or we even come to you. All right, question number two is this. Question number two is this. When, when you're coming through trans, boy, this is where a lot of us wash out right here. Number two, thanks, Fred, we got it. Are you willing to release the past? Are you willing to release the past? Are you willing to release the past? This is where most of us stop. Because we never saw or heard what God is saying and doing before. So what do we do? We pull on the past. We rely on the past. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 18 and 19 gives us an insight about the past. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 18 says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider, ponder, dwell on, meditate the things of old. Now, if you do, if you do, verse 19 says, Behold, I'll do a new thing. I'll spring forth, shall you not know it? I'll make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Now, if you don't let go of verse 18 and you're considering and pondering and meditating on the things of old, when God starts putting a river through the desert, you'll say, there is no way. You will not believe it. When he say, I, I can believe for a road through the, through the forest. I can see that. But I'm going to tell you, i got to let go of a, lot of a lot of my knowledge to believe there's going to come a river through the desert. A lot of geography, a lot of, you know, natural thinking that I have that, that rivers don't come through the desert. No. I got to let go of some former ways of thinking to believe that a river can come through the desert. But I'll tell you this more. Just because it's new to us doesn't stop God. He's going to put the river through the, through the desert whether you believe it or not. He's putting the road through the, through the forest whether you think it can be done or not. If you're training for transition, if you have a heart for truth, if you're spending time with Him, can you let go and release the past? As you move forward, can you let the past go? And I'm talking about good past and bad past, not just bad past. I'm talking about all the good past. Paul had to let go of all of his good past. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4, 5, and 6, he brags on his past. Here, here's what he says. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4. 
He said, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Paul said, I'm gonna, you, you think your flesh is good? I'm going to compare my flesh with your flesh. Verse 5. I was circumcised. Now see if you all can match this one Paul's saying. I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. That's the best. A Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee. He was creme de la creme. Verse 6. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness, check this out. Concerning the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. He was not blameless concerning the righteousnesses of the law. There was only one, Jesus, that, right? But he's saying, this is, I was good. I was good. I had a wonderful past. You're talking about background, education. I had it all rolling my way. And then he says in verse 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost, those I let go of. I had to let go of all that stuff that I worked so hard building. I spent so many years accumulating that made me good in everybody's eyes. Respect, that had to go. The things that were gained to me were the things I counted lost for Christ. Verse 8. Yes, indeed, I also counted all things lost for the excellency, for one thing, the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. Would you be willing this morning, can I ask you, would you be willing to let everything in your past go to have a better knowledge of Christ Jesus your Lord? If it required you to, to forsake everything that you've ever known, your perfect belief system, all your security, to give you a better knowledge, would you do it? Paul said, I, I had to let all that stuff go just for one thing. And he said, I've suffered the loss of everything for that. But he said, I'm looking at it, I count it like rubbish that I may gain Christ. Verse 9, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness. Boy, you can't have your own righteousness from the law. You have to let that go that you might get the righteousness which is of, through faith. The faith, remember we did a study on this, it's the faith of Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. Amen? So Paul, Paul is saying he had to let go of the bad. Verse 10. That I may know him, the power of his resurrection, fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. Look. Verses 4, 5, and 6 was his pedigree background. He had to let the pedigree go. He would have never been able to get to 7, 8, 9, and 10 until he let go of 4, 5, and 6. Are you, are you with me? You can't drag the past along with you trying to transition to what is in the future. As you let the past go for God's new wine, God's new transition, God's, God's new promotion, God's better thing, you're going, to find out, you're going to find out something else. And this is, again, why some people can't let the past go. Right? You're going to find out that most of God's step up are first steps down. From where you were in the past to where you're going today, most of the steps up that God's calling you to to transition would appear in the natural to be steps down. Things don't get better, they get worse. You don't have more, you have less. You're not advancing, you're in fact retreating. 500 people saw Jesus resurrect from the, from the, from the tomb. Out of the 500 that saw Jesus resurrect, 120 made it back to the upper room. 25%. Jesus has built his ministry to thousands of people in John 6. He comes with a heavy revy on communion about his blood and his body. And in the matter of three verses, his, his church goes from thousands to twelve. Jesus was calling for a transformation. Gideon had an army of 23,000. God said, I want you to go, but take only 300. It didn't get bigger, it got worse. When David was chasing the men that burned down Ziklag, he left half of them at the river, only half pursued. Here's Jesus' transition. We looked, we looked, at, we looked at Paul, he had to get rid of all that stuff to get what God had. Now look, 
Jesus. It doesn't always, it gets worse before it gets better. It gets smaller before it gets larger. It goes in reverse before it goes forward. That's why some can't handle it. When God comes and shows something, it's His will. We know it's His will, but I, the cost is too much on this thing. Now here's, here's, what Jesus, here's Jesus transitioning from Philippians chapter 2. Come there with me. I'm just going gonna, gonna to keep going until I'm done this morning. If you have to go to Luby's, go. <laughs> Verse 5. Verse 5. Philippians 2, 5. Here's Jesus. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Everybody says that. Wait, we got the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. Now what was the mind that was in Christ? Let me just read for you. Uh, verses 6, 7, and 8, the mind that was in Christ. Are you ready? Here's the mind. Now watch. It doesn't get bigger, it gets better. Who in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That was the mind of Christ. <laughs> I'd like to just stay there for the rest of the time. Because that's a good mind to have. Verse 7. Now here he, here he goes. Here's his transition. Made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. Now this is the savior of the world here we're talking about who is going to die for the world, be the savior of the world. And what does he do? Does he get bigger? Does he get larger when he comes from heaven? No, he gets smaller. He made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a bondservant and came in the likeness of man, verse 8. And being found in appearance of man, he humbled himself, being, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. So here we got God, God coming in the flesh. No fanfare. No, no public relations uh, extravaganza. Here God comes and he gets smaller. He has a mission to be the savior of the world. And what does he do? He retreats. Makes himself a no reputation. Becomes humble like a, a servant. Takes upon him the form of a man. Becomes obedient to death. The most humiliating death there is. The death on the cross. He's small, 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 smaller. Then what happens? Verse 9. Therefore, therefore. Remember, I, I told you whenever you read therefore, you have to read the preceding verses because therefore is a conclusion of what you just read. Therefore, the conclusion is because of that, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven, things in the earth, and those that are under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. He never would have hit 9 and 10 if he didn't go 6, 7, and 8. All right? Never would have hit 9 and 10. Never would, have, never would have had the name that was above every name. Never would have had the recognition by all, above the earth, in the earth, under the earth, proclaiming and recognizing that Jesus is Lord. And no man says that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So what a worldwide recognition. But this man, when he came to earth, he didn't come large and get bigger. He went small and got tinier. Okay, number one, is it the will of God? Number two, can you release the past? If you can't release the past, you washed out. Paul had to release it. Jesus had to release it. You'll have to release it. Not just all the, the bad deeds you did, not just all the junk, all the good stuff that you trusted in. Number three, are you ready for question number three? Question number three is this. Time of transition, number three, can you act courageously can you act courageously now you can if you know that God is with you if he's on your side you can if you know that God is responsible for you that you're his property you're off his off your hands onto his hands see God doesn't destroy his possessions can I just tell you God's not into destroying what he created he, he's not a destroyer he's a life giver now, here's Joshua transitioning. Here's Joshua. He's, he's the uh, second man to Moses. Moses dies. God comes and says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Time for you, Joshua. Now, here comes the transition. Now, God lays it out for him. In, in, in Joshua chapter 1, I'm going to read what he says to, to Joshua. 
Joshua chapter 1, verse 5. He says, Joshua, listen, you're the man. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. All right? As I was with Moses, so I'll be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. Can you act courageously? You can if you know that God is with you, that he won't leave you, he won't forsake you. And what did Jesus say to us? I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you. Amen? All right, verse 6. Be strong and of a good courage. Be strong and of a good courage. For to this people you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give to them. Verse 7. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand nor to the left that you may prosper wherever you go. Verse 8. The book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth. You shall meditate in it day and night. He's given him instructions that you may observe to do all that is written in it. For then you'll make your way prosperous. And then you'll have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of a good courage. Do you, do you kind of get the idea that God is saying be strong and of a good courage? He gives him all this other stuff. But then he says, over it all, you got to be strong and be courageous. You're making a transition, Joshua. Can you be courageous? He says, don't, don't be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Verse 18. Verse 18. Let's jump down just a little bit. Joshua 1.18. Whoever rebels against your command and does not heed your words, in all that you command him shall be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage. Four times in those verses, God says, be strong and be courageous. God said that. Look up here. I see y'all yawning. Don't be yawning on me. Four times God said, be strong and courageous. Do you know why he said that? Because he knew that Joshua would face opposition. He knew he would. Everybody wasn't going to have a big party for Joshua. Some were going to say, well, I think Fred should have let us know that Moses is gone. I, didn't, I never did vote for Joshua. I never did like the guy. I knew him when he was a kid. He was nothing special. Why should we follow Joshua? So God's over here saying, look, here's the way it's going to be. you got to make a transition. The only thing I ask is that you be courageous. Now here's the deal. Here's why some of us can't be courageous. We can't stand alone. To be courageous, you have got to be able to stand alone. When others are, when others are opposition and opposed and are saying no, and you know God has spoken, you have to be able to say, yes, I'll stand by myself. Did, isn't that what Jesus did? Everybody left. Everybody fled. It was just him. Him and Father. How many th even, even Paul came to the point when he said, oh, they've all left me. Everybody's gone. It's just me. God knew there would be people that did understand. God knows there are people that are content and happy to live the rest of their cotton-picking life on the wrong side of the Jordan. There are forces working through people that want you to lay down and quit. There are forces working through people that want to discourage you until you stop. But when you begin to stand up on the inside, when you know that you're God's man, you're man, God's woman at that business, at that office, at that wherever it is that you go, and you know God has said, I'll be with you, I won't leave you, I won't forsake you, you know it's the will of God, you've let go of the past, then God will speak, back to verse 5, then God will speak verse 5 to you out of Joshua chapter 1. Joshua 1, 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. They may oppose you, but they will not be able to stand before you. He said, as, as I was with Moses, I'll be with you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. And let's just plug Jesus in there instead of Moses for us. Because we're not under the law. We're, we're under grace. So no man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Jesus, I will be with you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. But you will have to stand alone. Act courageously. We act courageously for two groups. One group is other people. Some people will never get into the promised land if you don't lead them there. Some people will never go where they need to go unless they have a leader to lead them. If you don't lead, they don't go. But if you lead, they will respond. 
In verse 16 and 17 of that, of that first chapter of Joshua, uh, God laid that out for Joshua. And the people responded, and the people said, they answered Joshua saying, all that you command us we'll do, and wherever you send us we'll go. Verse 17. Just as, I, just as we heeded Moses in all things, so we will heed you. Only the Lord your God, your God be with you as he was with Moses. You see, those people would have never moved without Joshua. Without Joshua having the, the, the resolve to stand alone independently against all opposition, against those that wanted to stay on the wrong side of the Jordan, they would have never crossed over under Joshua's leadership if he was not willing to be courageous and go it alone. So one reason why you act courageously is for all the people you have influence in. All the people that know you, all the people that look at you, all the people that perceive that you're the one that hears God, that you're the leader. You're the one that takes them over. And second of all, you act courageously for yourself. If I'm a, here, let's pull the curtain back. If you don't act courageously for you, nobody else will. All right? You do what you need to do to make your way prosperous. You do, and by prosperous, I mean fulfilling the will of God. For if for you, you and God are an awesome team. You and God are a great team. And, and your part is just verse 7 and 8. Just verse 7 and 8. And I'm not going to read it again. I, I, I'm, I'm done there. I think you got it this morning. If you're in a spiritual transition this morning, transition of any kind in your life, is this the will of God? How do I know? I get a witness in my spirit by the Holy Spirit. I'm, I'm a person that knows, led by the Spirit. I get to know the Spirit. I spend time with God. He is a Spirit. The Word of God has, has spoken to me. People that are around me that I really trust, they also see it. Number two, I've, I can let go of the past. I'm not, I'm not bound to my past, good or bad. And number three, I'm acting courageously. I can stand alone. I can hang in there because I know that God is with me. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. And I'm acting courageously, standing on my own, because I know there are multitudes of people that may never get to where they need to go if I don't. And I have to be able to stand myself for me, because nobody else is going to stand for me. I have to do it. This is what I have to do under his anointing, his power, his strength, his direction, and his confirmation. Amen? Just bow your heads right where you're at. I want to pray for everybody in here this morning. I think if I, I said everybody making a transition in your life, come forward, I want to pray for you. The whole church would come forward. Because God is changing all of us. Some in little ways, some in big ways. So this morning, I, I, I pray for you. And I, I want you to listen to what God is saying this morning in your life. I, just, I pray for you this morning as you go through change. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you'll hear the voice of God clearly and directly. That you'll know that you've heard. That what you're sensing, what you're seeing, what you're feeling is the very target of His will. I pray this morning for you that the witness of the Spirit, God's Spirit with your Spirit, they will be joined together as one. This morning as you read God's Word, it will just come alive to you all week long. And whatever it is you're seeking and, and you're sensing, that as you meditate God's Word, that thing comes alive and you see that it's so. And I pray this morning that God give you people that will surround you, that know, that know the Lord, that know how He works, that you can feel sent, that you're not going on your own. This morning, in the name of Jesus, I, I take every tentacle of the past off of you. Somebody just felt a great release right there, that all the burdens of yesterday rolled away. You're free. I don't care how many times you failed. I don't care... What happened? I don't care how long you were gone. I don't care how many times you've been divorced. I don't care anybody. Those past is past. You've got to release the past. You have to be free of it this morning. Paul had to be free. Jesus had to be free of the past. I pronounce freedom over you this morning. Absolute freedom of your past. You're starting fresh this morning. And as those steps down begin to come into your life before the steps up that are so fun to enjoy happen. As it gets worse, maybe before it gets better. As it gets less, before it gets more. 
as you begin to retreat, even before you advance, just know that even as Jesus, God is giving you a name that would be the perfect name for you to live by. And people will know and the people will recognize that God is working through you. God is in you. There'll be no mistake. This morning I speak courage into your life. Some of you have had a real problem being cur courageous. You've, you've longed for the security of people. You've, you've, you've lived in the, uh, you know, you've lived in the, in the book of, of, of second common sense. You've just always done the thing that seemed reasonable. You haven't been able to stand. You've, been, you've always gone the way of, of public opinion. As soon as you started and somebody gave you resistance, you pulled back because you didn't want to be the one that stood alone. And you thought, how can they all be wrong and I'm right? I'm sure glad Paul didn't fall for that. I'm glad Jesus didn't fall for it. I'm glad Abraham didn't. I'm glad John Wesley. I'm gl glad John Calvin. I'm glad Zwingli. I'm glad all the reformers were willing to act courageously. What God is doing in the earth today is going to require courageous people. God knows there'll be people that don't understand you. People that oppose you. God knows there'll be forces working through people that want you to lay down and quit. And what God says to you today is, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. You and I will see this through to the end together. Father, this morning as we continue to be people that know how to make a change and transition. Father, my prayer for this whole congregation is that you'd give us the patience, the ability, the anointing, whatever we need to help others find true freedom in Jesus Christ. Father, as we encounter religion, as we encounter people that are bound up, give us the words to minister and make us patient to nurture them along at whatever pace they need to be nurtured. And Father, may we not be afraid to stand alone, let go of the past, and follow your will above all things.